Good morning, everybody. I'm Mark. That's Bill. There's Laura. Good to have you back. And, you know, I want to talk about the convention, guys, in a second, but I understand there really is some breaking news. So now let's go to the Growing Boulder Weather Center and amateur meteorologist Mike Nannis. He didn't know I was going to do this. I <laughs> should have known you were going to do this. Tell, tell, us, what <laughs> the break, tell us what well, the happening. Tell us what according break, what, a, According to the wires, tropical storm Laura has just formed off the Florida coast. <laughs> and and we are in the cone of, what do they call it, Mike? The cone of uncertainty. The cone of, un we are always in Laura's wow. cone of uncertainty. But, but <laughs> always. Always. Yeah. You never know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I, I have to say I have mixed emotions about this. I, I've never had a storm with my name, but I certainly don't want to cause any trouble. I hope you guys said that the cone of uncertainty flattens out. Amen. <laughs> uh, I think there was a, a, a Marco years ago. I just can't see Hurricane Bill. Has there ever been a Hurricane Bill? Never. Well, I'm sure it, well, there was, and it was probably pretty fierce. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Right, um, gingerly going to walk around uh, the Democratic National Convention, the, the Republican National Convention coming up next week. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't really want to get political at all, folks. Uh, I just want to encourage everybody to get out and vote. Uh, you know, it's it's critically important that everybody's uh, vote is is heard and counted. And uh, the Democrats, I, I think, put on a pretty good show, considering that uh, for the first time it was virtual. Uh, you know, I was always interested in, you know, the NFL had the highest ratings they've ever had for, for the NFL draft. And it was entirely, you know, kind of uh, punching around. But uh, I, I, my favorite thing in the Democratic National Convention was when they had the roll call and, you know, 57 different people uh, standing in something that represented their state. Uh, you know, they gave them all just a little bit of time and, and they all crushed it. It was an interesting and, and a great piece of television production. I hope they keep that. I thought that was really a great idea for us to relate to one another as Americans and where everybody comes from. That was really smart. And Billie Eilish was pretty darn good too. She did a great performance. And you know, it's important now not to let our guard down with the COVID stuff, but it's okay to shift the focus a little bit to other things as well. So, you know, you have the conventions the last week and coming up this coming week, and uh, we actually have some sports. You know, baseball is still hanging in there, even though they're having some issues with COVID. I watched hockey last night. The Islanders ousted the Capitals in a big surprise and people people are beginning to have conversations again about mm -hmm. things that aren't pandemic related mm -hmm. and i think all in all as long as we keep our guard up that's a good thing and masks on guard up masks on yep all right, let's talk about what's coming up because we are all excited about this. We've got a live interview with uh, rock drummer extraordinaire Liberty DeVito. Liberty best known, of course, for his three-decade run with the piano man Billy Joel. His brand new memoir is Liberty, Life, Billy, and the Pursuit of Happiness, in which he pretty much buries the hatchet after that well-publicized falling out with Billy Joel. Uh, this should be a great interview because Liberty is not only a very cool guy, uh, he's been friends with Bill for many years, and he and Laura actually have a, a very interesting connection as well. So I'm looking forward to this, guys. Oh, yeah, It's going to be really fun. I haven't seen him in a long time, but I don't know if you two have any idea the significance of Billy Joel and the band in the late 70s and 80s to Long Island culture and, and still continues today. I mean, we we built our weekends about wondering where the band might show up. It was all about band sightings and might you see Liberty or Richie, or Richie Cannata or Russell Javers or where was Billy Joel going to show up? And in eighth grade, okay, get this. I, I don't think my mother knows this. Eighth grade, I rode my bicycle to the Nassau Coliseum. I had to cross a highway, rode my bicycle to the Coliseum, convinced the guard to let me in so that I could see a Billy Joel concert, even though I didn't have a ticket because they were just, they were our local band on Long Island. They but you had a pretty good local band. And part of the reason they had this mystique, if you've never seen Billy Joel's drummer, Liberty DeVito, <laughs> go to YouTube, look it up. Oh my this God. guy, you, it, he was the, obviously the drummer's a driving force. But how many drummers can you name from bands you love? You know, Ringo and Liberty DeVito. And the he deserves mm -hmm. every, every, every accolade that comes his way. Great player, great guy. That's for sure. I think, I think our boss is frozen, Bill. I think he's frozen. 
So we may have to just keep this show going. There so. you go. See, see if we can tap them. So the, the next thing we were going to talk about was what, Laura? What did we want to talk about? Oh. Happy birthday for Hester Ford. Hester Ford is from Charlotte, North Carolina, born in 1904. She is 116 this week. She is the oldest living American. How do you like that? The oldest living American. She has, uh, I can't even believe these numbers, 125 great grandchildren and at least 120 great, great grandchildren. Now I there's only- I can't even think of 125 names. Much right? Less trying to remember who's who. That's incredible. Hey, there yeah. it is. And you know what I think is so impressive about her is that she lived alone until she was 108 years old. That's bold. She yeah. was doing well, feeling good until 108. And then her 87 year old daughter came in to help her out a little bit. It's fantastic. What a family. She did not have to live with the stress of internet connections, of <laughs> Wi-Fi going out. I mean, I think that I, I, I think there's more stress in this modern world uh, than there ever was. So, uh, uh, yeah, really is a remarkable woman. Yeah, before we leave that topic, I mean, how, how it's one thing to be old, but it's another thing to be old and alive. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. seems like it seems like she's aware. She has she's experiencing joy. She's able to do things. That that's the blessing of age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I know we found um, a great video this week, and now I'm not sure how you two relate to this because you're back in the office a little bit, but I'm still working out of the kitchen. <laughs> and Katie French, she's a praise and worship leader from Atlanta, and she put this Facebook video on about quarantine eating and a quarantine snacking. It's called I'm at the Fridge Again. Now I want you to watch this closely because not only does she sing harmony and melody, she plays nine different characters in this video and it's absolutely hysterical. She's at the fridge again. I think it's time for my snack She's at all, the but it's only been two minutes since yeah. the last visit. She's at the fridge oh, again. I'm gonna she need is. your help. Please come get her. I need you right now. She needs your help. She's at the fridge again. What about the chicken? Sit down. Mashed potatoes. Sit down. Them collard greens. Sit down. How about them eggs? Sit down. Or oh, some fruit. Sit down. Watermelon. Sit down. Ice cream. Sit down. A water. Oh, sit down. How about a pickle? Sit down. Pop silver. Sit down. Or a slice of cheese. Sit down. Oh, oh sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I love the rhyme of pickle and popsicle. It's great. She's brilliant. Katie French. One, yeah, one, of the great, to stop. one of the great things about music, you know, you can tell she's a praise leader. She's a worship singer and she's put something together that, you know, amuses everybody. Can you imagine uh, if she was backed up by a very talented rock and roll drummer? I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh, would that be something? Yeah, especially a rock and roll drummer that comes from a place of joy. And that's oh. the difference. That's why we like KD French in that video that actually my wife, Mary, thank you for finding that for us. But that's what this guy had. And that's the secret ingredient that's missing from a lot of people. Hey, do you, do you love Billy Joel? I mean, it's like asking whether or not you love pie. Everybody loves Billy Joel. Everybody. So many hits. So many great songs. Well, Billy wrote them, but it was his drummer who brought them to life, who took great songs and made them classic songs by his energy, by his talent, by his drum beats. It was something. And he did it for 30 years, too. So it wasn't just a flash in the pan thing until for reasons he couldn't figure out. One day, Billy called him and said that you're out. Well, that sent him into a, a spiral of broken relationships, substance abuse, and the persona that he had worked so hard for mm -hmm. had been ripped right from him. Well, Lib, Liberty DeVito has written an amazing book about his amazing life. And when we reached out to have him on the program, he graciously said yes. So, Liberty DeVito, welcome to Growing Older. How are you? Sir? <laughs> but I can't hear Bill. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. How about now? No, Laura, Laura, can he hear? See if he can hear you. Can you hear, hear me, Liv? Can you hear me, Liberty? No. Uh -oh. Can you, can you hear? Can you I hear, hear you. me? Yes. I you can hear, hear you. who? Mark. Yeah. Or you. 
Okay, Mark, you're on. You're doing the hey, interview, pal. The, the guy who was not involved at all, and, and now he's back. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I love I'll hold that. some uh, questions up. <laughs> well, uh, you know, keep trying, guys. But first of all, let me just congratulate you on your, your book, Liberty. I mean, it could have been, uh, you know, are you still there? I'm here. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, it could have been the nail in, in the coffin in terms of your relationship. There you go, Billy. Hold it up. In terms of your relationship with Billy Joel, but it, it turned out much different than that. Was it cathartic for you to write this? And what has it done to your relationships with Billy Joel? Well, it actually started out, I started writing uh, my family history for my children. I wanted them to know uh, where, that, uh, where my grandparents came from in Italy and what it was like growing up with my parents and stuff like that. And then when me and Billy kind of parted ways, I started to write about the, the career. And um, yeah, I must admit that in the beginning, it had some rough edges and I had to smooth them out uh, because I feel that the, uh, with age, we hopefully mellow out a bit. And I think I did. And I tried to look at things uh, standing in Billy's shoes rather than standing in my own and try to figure out why he did what he did. And when I saw it in a different light, I kind of understood him more and why he had to make the decisions. Look, I figured like the man's name is on the marquee. He's got to write a new album and he's got to write 14 songs at least, which four of them have to be top 40 hits. Um, he plays piano, he sings, and I'm just a drummer in the band and I'm getting mad because I want to go on tour in uh, April, and he doesn't want to go out till May, you know. So, you know, I, I kind of looked at it from from his point of view, and and um, you know, it was really interesting to look at it like that. Not easy to do, Billy. Can uh, can you hear Bill Schaefer now? I can't can hear, hear Bill Schaefer. No, can I can't hear, hear Bill Schaefer. How about no? me? Can you hear me? Got me yet, Liberty? No? I think he, I think he's messing with you guys because he just wants to talk with uh, <laughs> with me. So, uh, so no. yeah, so you. I'll keep Let it going, Liberty. Mark, Mark, it would be Laura would be the one that would be on now. If <laughs> We're going to get to that in a minute. But, um, you know, I, I think what you've done is really, really profound, you know, and it's all part of growing up and, and aging. You know, we need to learn to step back and, and to live in someone else's shoes because because we all make everything about us. And, you know, not only did your relationship with Billy Joel end for a while, uh, you know, your relationship with the band, your ability to go on tour when you wanted to, and your marriage, uh, you know, totally mm. fell apart. Uh, how hard was it for you, Liberty, to get beyond that? Because you seem like a pretty well-adjusted and happy guy right now. It was, it was hard. I mean, living in a bubble for 30 years, was, uh, it was tough when that bubble burst. I mean, I was no longer that guy, Billy Joel's drummer. I was no longer that guy. So uh, uh, I had to build myself back again. And I mean, it was depressing. Uh, you know, there was, there was thoughts, like I talk about in the, in the book, of, of backing the car into the garage and turning it on, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I had a lot of uh, support. I have, uh, you know, beautiful children. Uh, my parents were still alive at the time. They were supporting me. And, and um, you know, I knew I had to move on. The thing that was tough was, uh, what was how was I going to move on? How was I going to go from being Billy Joel's drummer to not being Billy Joel's drummer anymore? Uh, and a guy at Sabian, Wayne Blanchard, said to me, he goes, look, you've got to stop saying that you were formerly the drummer for Billy Joel. No, you are the guy that Billy chose to help him create those unbelievable hits and those unreal tours, you know, that's who you are. And when he said that, it was like, yeah, every time I hear a Billy Joel record on the radio, that's me. I'm still there, you know? So I was able to live like that and uh, rebuild my life again. And um, it's been great ever since. You know, we love your story for so many reasons. And I don't know if Bill and, uh, Bill and Laura, you guys, can we hear you yet? If not, maybe Please. you should. Oh, I hear you, Bill. Oh, you got me now? Oh, no, I don't. I don't. Oh, can oh. you hear me yet? Can you hear Laura? Laura? No. no? Why don't you guys so back out, Mark, yeah, back back out and come back in and see if that'll do it. And, 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 and let me ask you this, Liberty, because we've done many interviews with, you know, Bill especially has these connections. And we've done interviews with a lot of rock stars, uh, you know, like yourself. And it doesn't always end well. Uh, you know, we just love no. your story because, you know, I, I, 
you know, who among us uh, at a very early age in our 20s faced with, you know, stardom and girls and drugs and opportunity and money, uh, especially back in the 60s and 70s, how many of us would have survived it? Uh, you know, what enabled you to survive it? Uh, and, I, and I'm guessing your family and friends were a big part of it. Oh, yeah, a huge part of it. Well, you know, the, the book is about my journey. Uh, you know, a lot of guys put out these videos and they may write their books about how, oh, I went to Berkeley and I learned how to play paradiddles. And then I became very famous because of that. You know, I became a great drummer and everything was great. And I went on to play Madison Square Garden and I went on to play Radio City Music Hall, and blah, blah, blah. Now, my road was the road that is real. Uh, you know, there were many roads to choose from and some of them were very, very dark. I was fortunate enough to be able to get off those dark roads, but someone like Doug Stegmaier, who was our bass player, did not get off the dark road and ended up ending his life. Um, so yeah, my family, uh, the support I got from my family really, really, really held me up there. We're talking with Liberty DeVito, who is well known uh, by just about everybody for his 30 year uh, collaboration with Billy Joel. I mean, he was the guy that 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 that, that made the beats. And, uh, you know, he's written a new memoir that it, that is fascinating. Bill and Laura are back in. Can we hear you? Can check, you hear check. us now? Uh, I hear you now. Yes. Yay. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, well, let well, me jump you know, in just for a quick one, because I know Laura, Laura is a part everybody wants to hear. Uh, no. the, the, what Liberty did, and, and, and I really want to make this point, too, what Liberty did that was so different, and the reason that, that everybody just latched on to, first of all, Billy's music was great, but Liberty didn't play drums like other drummers. He kind of mm -hmm. plays lyrics. You know, he yeah. plays the feeling of the song, the mood and the emotion. There are not a lot of guys that do that. And you could sit there in the crowd, and you could all these videos that are out there, Billy is watching Liberty. The crowd is watching Liberty. When Billy forgot lyrics, Liberty remembered them. He needed the words before he could play a song. It, it seems so basic and simple, but it's so unique. And, and, and Liberty, do you think that that kind of sensitivity to, to music and creativity is kind of what helped pull you through life, through realizing what was important and when you went too far and when you had to pull back? Yeah, I think, uh, well, uh, as far as the music goes, I, I in what they considered a songwriter's drummer. You know, mm. I, I love to play the drums, but I love music. I love music the most. You know, uh, you know, I don't know. My parents bought me drums and I didn't ask for them. And when I asked my dad later on in my career, why did you buy me drums? He said, because they didn't make Prozac when you were a kid. <laughs> so... He, <laughs> So he, he drums, uh, but but yeah, the lyric is is very very important to me, and uh, you know life has lyrics all through it, and and uh, you know you are what you become is how you grew up, you know, um, and some of the things that I grew up with, like when I talk about my dad and and you know him being very violent to me. Uh, uh, you know, I, I needed a life coach to, to break me from that. And, and in the end, when my father was dying, I told him he was my hero and I loved him hmm. because I was able to get over that. And, uh, you know, life is too short to, to be carrying around that kind of weight, you know, and uh, have, I had the support of my, my children. And uh, it was just great. You know, I just love it. You know, I, I you know what I say? I, I see these drummers play. They do drum clinics and they, they're real flashy and they're all over the place and they're very fast and stuff like that. And I always say that I'm not really a drummer. I just play one on stage. That's what I do. I, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I think about that, Liberty, when I hear your story, because there are so many people who spend 30 years in a career and one day their boss is like, mm, sorry, gotta let you go. And your job, it, your job sort of describes you. It, it is who you are. Yeah. And, and maybe you have something to say to some of the people who are, uh, who are watching or who know somebody who maybe at 40 or 50 or 60 was told, sorry, younger person coming in, you know, how do you refine yourself? Well, I had, a uh, like, I found that, you know, they say that, that when you're on your deathbed, <laughs> and you look up, who do you want to see? Who do, who do you really want to see? I want to see my daughters and my wife. You know, those are the, the main people I want to see. I want to see my sister. That's family. That mm. comes first. And I neglected my family 
a lot when uh, we were really successful. I mean, we, we made an album. We went on the road. We came home, made another album, went on the road. And I uh, have four daughters ranging from the age 40 to three. And uh, my, I watch my three-year-old now, and I see her doing things that I never saw with the other ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed at how much I missed, you know? So when you're asked to be cut off, make sure that you have your priorities in order. I, I didn't when I was cut off. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had just gotten divorced, too. And, mm -hmm. and so my children were, were really upset at me. I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, it was a 50-50 uh, agreement that we were going to split, but they were very upset that it happened. And so I had to re win them back because I knew that they were the most important thing in my life. And it wasn't until years later that I got the music back again, you know? Mm -hmm. Hey, so, I, I so didn't I, know if Liberty, I was just going to say, Mark, real quick, I don't know if you, I, we didn't introduce Liberty to Laura. I don't know if you guys uh, have ever met before. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Tell us the story because we teased it. Uh, Laura, tell, tell, tell us the story. Laura, you tell. Okay, so I don't know if you guys remember these kind of restaurants that had like bottomless salad and endless sangria. Very popular in the eighties. It was the remember? bunnery. The bunnery. That's it. I couldn't remember the name. <laughs> yes. The bunnery. So was... my 18th birthday, I was there with a group of girls. There were probably six of us. Um, and I told you earlier that there was this whole thing about band sightings, Billy Joel band sightings. And everybody, I mean, you dreamt that you'd be out on a Saturday night and you'd bump into one of the guys. Well, we're there screaming and drinking sangria and being silly. And I even remember what I was wearing because it was so obnoxious, this short red dress with white and red tights. I mean, I hope I threw those tights out. But Liberty was sitting at another table with a whole bunch of other band members and handsome guys and stuff. And suddenly you sent me a happy birthday shot of tequila. The first shot of tequila I ever had was from you. <laughs> When your husband was in the studio with, with Richie Kanata in Cove City recording something over there, Richie called me up right away and he goes, you won't believe this. You won't believe it. He told me that you were there and you told him that story. Uh, it's just crazy. It, it's I have to thank you for that because when you're an 18 year old girl and all your girlfriends are like gorgeous and everything and Billy Joel's drummer sends you a shot of tequila, <laughs> my cred went way up, Lib, way up. I don't know if you read it yet, Laura, but that's chapter eight. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let, let's wrap this up. I think we could go forever, Liberty. And I know Bill wants to ask you about, you know, what life is like at 70. And let me just preface that question, Bill, if you'll allow it, uh, to, to say that, you know, I get irritated when people say that, you know, 60 is the new 40 or 70 is the new 50. Now, 70 is the new 70. Uh, okay. And Liberty DeVito is representing what that is. Uh, you know, everything is changing in terms of he's unlike any 70 year old that, that we knew 20 or 30 years ago. You know, when think of your grandparents when they were 70. So, uh, amen. Thank you for what you're doing. And Billy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, put her in the garage for us. Yeah, Lib, we're all in the hope I die before I get old rock generation. You know, what were we thinking? You know, when I'm 64, you know, we thought that was right. ancient. But look at you. You just turned 70. Happy birthday, by the way, earlier this Thank month. You. You're the father of a three-year-old. You've got a very happy marriage. You're part of the amazing Lords of 52nd Street folks. You have to see these guys when they get back on the road and come near you. And the, a band called the Slim Kings, just they got a groove that doesn't quit. So tell us, what is life like? And did you ever expect it would be like this for you at the age of 70? You know, I actually uh, cursed myself when, when I started to play the way I play. When people saw me when I was in, in my 20s and 30s, I was playing hard. Well, they expect to see that again when they come see us now. So I had to do a lot of changing. I mean, yes, physically, you kind of break down a little bit. And I got a new knee. Uh, I do have to wear hearing aids now because of the drums. They made me deaf. And, um, uh, but I don't eat meat anymore. I stopped dairy. And all my arthritis in my arms went away mm. for some miracle. And um, I, I stay fit. I stay fit. And I chase my little three-year-old around. I put her on my shoulders. I carry her around the neighborhood. 
and I just love doing it. I love life all over again. It's, it's just a wonderful place to be. Hmm. And that's growing bolder, isn't it? That's, that's it sure exactly is. what it means. Well, here's mm -hmm. the book, folks. It's called Liberty DeVito, Life, Billy, and the Pursuit of Happiness. I don't know, maybe one day, Liberty, do you think maybe one day Billy might say, come on up, and would you want to do it? Well, I would prefer if he would came to see the Lords and came in and sat in with the Lords yeah. rather than me going to the garden. Well, the and Lords are the real are the real band. That would be like going to see the E Street Band and having Bruce sit in with the boys, you know? Yes. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Well, listen, Liberty, best of luck. Hope you get through everything and let's get back out on the road because, man, you still have a you still have a lot of people to entertain. Thanks for everything and the especially the inspiration. Well, uh -huh. Bill, I've been waiting for you to call. Since the book came out, I've been waiting for you to call. Good tell, to see you. Tell, tell Jim I said hi. You it's, got it. Okay. That's awesome. Isn't he amazing? I mean, I knew I knew what he was going to bring. And the, the guy is just, you just want to be around him. Because no matter how old you are, whatever, you feel like you. You know, you feel like mm -hmm. you can do what what is you. You know what? I, I love that he's so honest about this story of redemption, how he had to get back. He had to forgive people. He had to find himself again. That's not easy. So many people, as they get older, refuse to take that step and just wallow in it. He uh, He's a champ. He's a champ. All right. Liberty is a tough act to follow, but, uh, you know, somehow I think that uh, Cesar might be able to do it. Uh, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago, guys, we shared a photo of Cesar, the no drama llama and his owner, Larry McCool. And, you know, we were just intrigued by this whole thing. We sure were. So we had to hear more. Now, Cesar is a therapy llama, if you never knew that existed. he What his job is to give these soft and furry hugs to people. Larry takes him around and he brought him around to Portland during the protests. And what happened there was he encouraged peace and calm in such a tense situation. And people loved it. Look at this. They were, they were just coming over to Cesar and hugging him and it brought instant calm. And, you know, part of growing bolder is getting to the bottom of things and figuring out who is this guy, who is this llama, and what in the world are they doing there? So we wanted to know a little bit more about this unusual type of active activism. And it turns out that both the llama and the guy are a great story. And uh, Larry McCool is his name, Cesar, the drama llama. Larry, because even at the age of 66, he's out there. He's involved. You know, you see mostly young people. Where are the people our age voicing their opinions and, and standing up for what they believe in? So we asked him. And as it turns out, for Larry, activism is nothing new. It was uh, really the late 60s and uh, 70s going to uh, events in my, in my teens. Then in the early 70s, I started working very political uh, events. You know, we, I was involved in a lot of uh, uh, environmental groups, a lot of uh, social change groups, uh, political campaign, every presidential campaign is a volunteer. We've uh, marched with all of them and we've uh, canvassed with the governor, we canvassed with the, our US senators, we canvassed with our US representatives. Uh, so this is kind of a normal fit. And then when I find a partner like this, who can actually draw as much attention to a, a cause, you know, it, it was it was well worth it. And shortly <laughs> after this interview, Larry was eaten by the llama. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was nuzzling, Bill. That was, uh, you know, that was some world class nuzzling. And it, 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 at times it was difficult to tell Larry from Cesar, but uh, but, but what a great guy. And, you know, he was game. Uh, we got in contact with him. He walked outside into the corral with the llama and, and did the interview for us. So, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, one other point there. I mean, that was just a little bit of a very interesting interview. I mean, we learned a lot about Cesar. We learned a lot about, about llamas we never knew. It was very interesting. And Larry tells more of his story. And you can see that where? <gasps> On Growing Boulder. <laughs> Dot com. Please check that site out. I mean, it is like this show times hundreds of great stories, lots of inspiration, all kinds of things. Growingbolder.com. Wanted to get that in.
Amen, Brother Bill. Let's talk about uh, caregiving because the pandemic, uh, you know, has been beyond difficult for all of us, but especially so for unpaid caregivers. In fact, a study came out this week that is just stunning that says uh, 31% of unpaid caregivers uh, since the pandemic began have had thoughts of suicide. That's a 300% increase from before the pandemic began. And I think it really makes our Caregiving Summit, The Art of Caregiving, even more important. So take a listen to this. On August 27th, Florida Blue Medicare presents The Art of Caregiving. Growing bolder and archangels get real. Real people, real connection, real stories. It's about making the critical mind shift from focusing on loss and limitation to celebrating passion and possibility. Join Mark Middleton and Alexandra Drain, plus many other experts as we learn and laugh together, delivering a message on caregiving unlike any you've ever heard. Register at no cost thanks to Florida Blue Medicare. Visit growingbolder.com slash caregiving summit. So save the date. That's this coming Thursday, August 27th at 11 a.m. It's online only, but you do have to register. You'll get an access code. And, you know, one of the cool things, guys, is we've got some amazing guests and all attendees will receive a guide to caregiving, another art of caregiving ebook that's been produced especially for this summit and many other tools and resources. So uh, we're, we're looking forward, uh, you know, kind of to try and do our thing uh, in terms of helping caregivers out. And this is useful to everybody in in every state, wherever you live, you know, sign up and and watch this online, be a part of it. And your first reaction might be, ooh, it's going to be down. It's going to be difficult. (laughs) This is the most uplifting, empowering thing. So if there's anybody in your life, as they're aging, you wonder, well, what's going to happen? You know, how are we going to keep their quality of life up? This is is about joy. This is about Mm -hmm. empowerment. These are tools. And all of the things that Mark learns in this with all these experts, they also work in your personal relationships. It's not just about caregiving. It's how to be more human. It's like Liberty was saying. This this is a great thing. Don't miss your chance to check out the uh, Caregiving Summit. Thank you, guys. So is it time for our meme? I believe it is. I believe it's meme stream. (laughs) Meme stream. Well, we've got a great one this week. Embrace optimism. You'll live longer. Now, we're not just saying that. This is an actual fact. Optimistic people live longer. They proved it at Yale University. They did a study and they showed that with more positive self-perceptions, you can live up to eight years. It's like seven and a half years longer than if you have a negative uh, perception of aging. And another study found that older people with positive attitudes, should that be that hard? They're about 44% more likely to fully recover from disability than people who accept the negative stereotypes of aging. So it's not just fluff and it's not just, you know, mental hocus pocus. If you have a positive attitude, if you're willing to push forward, if you want to live life, if you believe in you, it makes a difference in how you move forward. And that's great news. Mm -hmm. That is definitely what's on Bill's mind this morning, and we appreciate that. Uh, what's on my mind is, you know, at Growing Boulder, we're always trying uh, to remind ourselves who we are and what we stand for. And uh, I think that's how a brand uh, becomes authentic. And I say it all the time, we're not ignoring the realities of aging. Uh, we're not pretending that there will be difficult challenges of head, uh, ahead. Uh, that would just be dumb and disingenuous. We're not saying you have to become an athlete or an author or an entrepreneur. We just want you to become the best version of you, whatever that is. And since we live in an overtly ageist culture, it takes changing your mindset in order to do that. It's not easy. About 10 years ago, I wrote a Growing Boulder manifesto that still today pretty much represents who we are and what we believe. So, you know, if you'll indulge me for just a couple of minutes, uh, I'd like to read it to you. Uh, The Growing Boulder manifesto, the stereotypes of ageism embedded in our psyche make us fear what can be the best days of our lives. We've been programmed to give up. 
brainwashed into believing that when our skin begins to wrinkle, our dreams begin to die. Remember when we thought that the future was filled with limitless possibility, when there was time to do just about anything? There still is. It's never too late. Dreams don't have an expiration date. There's still time to learn a new instrument, to pick up a paintbrush, to start a new business, to get back into shape, or even to get into shape for the first time. Just about anything is possible. Dreams are not about age, they're about attitude. With few exceptions, Madison Avenue, the mainstream media, and Hollywood all underestimate our passion and our potential. They don't respect our dreams, our desires, or even our money. Ageism, like racism and sexism, is rooted in fear and ignorance, and it threatens the future of every one of us, including our children and our grandchildren, because age is a fate only the unfortunate escape. Refuse to accept the negative stereotypes of aging. If your mind believes them, so will your body. Are you unhappy with who you are, with where you are in life? Do you long for more? Then go find it. Quit waiting for life to find you and quit waiting for permission to find it. Get off the couch and get into life. Happiness is not about age. It's about attitude. Be optimistic about your future and take a leap of faith. Pursue your passions. Find your purpose. And don't say you don't have a purpose. You probably just haven't found it yet probably because you stopped looking. Finding passion and purpose is not about age, it's about attitude. And don't quit when you fail because you probably will, at least at first, because everyone does. To be afraid to fail is to be afraid to live. The only question that matters is how many times are you willing to fail before you succeed? Success is not about age, it's about attitude. Move forward, but always give back. Help others any way you can. A simple act of kindness can change someone's day and and maybe even their life. Making a difference is not about age, it's about attitude. Always believe that the rest of your life can be the best of your life. The most powerful weapon in the war against ageism is the simple example of an ordinary person living an extraordinary life. You can be that person. So stop growing older and stop growing bolder. The Growing Bolder Manifesto written about 10 years ago, guys, uh, and I think it still applies. Not only does it apply, it's proven by guests like Liberty. And we're trying to do this so, as he would say, so you don't have to hit rock bottom to have all of these priorities coalesce in your life and in your mind. Figure out what your life's really about. Don't wait any longer. Make today the beginning of the whole new you, the you you always wanted to be. You know, it's funny. This week I was out walking. I don't know if you could. Whoops, that's. That's not it. I was wearing my Growing Boulder Defy T-shirt. And as I was wearing that, I started writing my own manifesto. I said, I think it's time I do this next chapter. Next, what is my manifesto for the rest of my life? And I was so happy to hear what you were saying. It was right in line. And you know, I challenge everyone who's watching, write that manifesto. What are you doing for the next decade? What is your plan? Who are you going to be? Grow bolder with us. You know, that, thank you for that. Uh, and it makes me think back, you know, when the girls were young, uh, we wrote a Middleton family mission statement that, uh, you know, where, where we talked about what our values are, how we treat one another, what our responsibility to society is. So call it a manifesto, call it a mission statement. But uh, I think, Laura, you make a good point. Every individual, every family, every business, every organization should have one. So we'll leave you with that and look for you right here next week. Have a good one, folks. See you next week. Growing bolder, what's next?